This is so not going to be one of my more popular videos, but whatever. Are you kidding? Our banter will carry it. Welcome to a walkthrough of the beautifully named Finding Alignment Between Interpretable Causal Variables and Distributed Neural Representations. I am joined by the one and only Atticus Geiger, who wrote this paper and will help me walk through it. I have spent five minutes looking at this paper, so I'm very excited to learn about it along with everyone else. Atticus, want to say a bit of introduction for yourself? Sure. Thanks so much, Neil. I'm a PhD student at Stanford right now. I'm, oddly enough, in the linguistics department, though there is not going to be any real linguistics in this paper. And uh, yeah, this is collaborative work with Zen Wu, Chris Potts, Thomas Eichard, and Noah Goodman. And excited to go through it. I think it's going to have lots of interesting connections with mechanistic interpretability. And I think trying to work out how to use mechanterp jargon to describe this paper in the best way I will be like a rewarding experience. So yes. Ah, yes. I come from like the mechanterp field, which is its own weird cultural cluster with its own jargon. Atticus comes from an academic background doing basically the same thing, but with his own cluster of jargon. <laughs> so it'll be very exciting seeing how much we both get confused during this walkthrough. Also, I want to apologize on Atticus's behalf for the emails being in the wrong order compared to the author list. I promise the rest of the papers, way higher production quality. <laughs> hey, we've traveled back in time to give an overall summary of this and pull the video where we then figure out what on earth is actually about, because it's kind of confusing. Elevator pitch for this paper. Causal models are the right way to think about neural networks and interpreting them. We have variables, we have algorithms like sidewalk is wet if it is raining and is wet or dry, some like nice logical thing. We want to impose these causal models on the neural network. The way we do this is with causal interventions. You pick some bit of the model, you replace it with its value and some other inputs, and you look at how this changes the output and compare that to what the mod causal model predicts to change the output. Like you think that the model is taking X and Y and outputting X plus Y. If you intervene on the model such that you replace some internal bit with like adding well, the inputs three and four and the inputs three and seven. If you intervene on a bit of the model such that you only replace the first input, the output should remain three plus four rather than with this random other thing. This is the idea of a patch or an interchange intervention. And the problem trying to solve in this paper is where we're trying to do this mapping onto a causal model, but rather than having like the right units or variables as neurons or heads, like the right units to analyze, what we instead have going on is our internal representations are these big chunky vectors. And there should be some meaningful directions that correspond to units, but we don't know what these are. And the point of this paper is using gradient descent to find the right directions such that these interchange interventions work. And using this to validate we found the right units for a model. I think this is exciting because we often don't know what the right units are. Anyway, I will now return you to the actual video where we go and figure all of this out together. But hopefully you can have that in the back of your mind as a map. All right, all right. First question. What does alignment, interpretable causal variables, and distributed neural representations mean? So alignment does not mean aligning AI with our ethical values. Here, alignment, we mean purely a mathematical object that is telling you a relationship between a tiny causal model and a larger causal model. So the alignments we're talking about is an alignment that's going to say, this variable in a high-level simple model is faithfully summarizing or aggregating the causal mechanisms of this cluster or set of low-level causal variables. Just stopping you briefly, a causal model is just like any structure that you think could describe an algorithm. Yeah, so when we say causal model, we really want to be super general, where we're just talking about any discrete set of variables that take on some values. And then there are just functions that tell you the value a variable should take on, given the values of its parents. Okay, okay. There's a lot of jargon in there. So we have this diagram, and you're saying you start with two inputs, P and Q. You set two variables to be equal to P and equal to Q. And then you have some third variable that's like and. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't know, 
P is zero, Q is one. You've got this node that represents zero, a node that represents one, and then V3 is like zero and one, which is zero. That's exactly correct. So why do you have a node for P and then a node for V1 equals P? Aren't those like the same? That's a good question. So you can have sort of like chains of variables that are just copying each other. And what you can think of that as giving you at the high level is the ability to express your hypothesis that the same piece of information is being carried in a flow of time. So if you have just saying like V P to V1 copies P and then to like Z1 just copies V1, that could be saying the hypothesis like P is here and then P is here and then P is here as the information flows through the network. And if you could align those with low level neural clusters, you'd be able to say, yep, the same information is included here causally as well. You could do interventions and set it to be whatever value you want. And so crucially, this gets to a kind of like deep, interesting point, which is that being forced to encode your high level hypotheses as causal models sometimes will make you like do sort of like unintuitive, weird structures or interesting things and maybe make you decide on choice points that you didn't even realize you had to be making to state a particular hypothesis. What do you mean by choice points? Say like the bubble sort algorithm. There's sort of a choice point like maybe not bubble, a bucket sort, where you could do the left bucket or the right bucket. That's a choice point. But when you're forced to write down every single variable that is used, you actually realize that you're able to sort of abstract away some details or not abstract away certain details. And it becomes a lot more complicated to describe any interesting object once you realize there are so many different levels of description at which to describe that object. Like, I want to give a causal model of how I put on my shoes I know I put on socks and then put on shoes, but I could put on my right sock first, my left sock first. And this is just like an arbitrary thing I need to decide on? Yeah. Cool. All yeah. right. Makes sense. So going back to what is aligning a causal model, it's like you've got this kind of tiny toy causal model where you know what it means. It's this really simple logical structure, and you have some more complicated thing doing a more complex calculation, and you want to be able to say... Everything in the small model exactly corresponds to a thing in the big model with the same structure. But I don't know. Why do you have care about having a big model again? So the big complicated model? Yeah. Why can't we just only look at the tiny ones? Well, I guess that is sort of the dream of interpretability, I think, is at some <laughs> point to have the tiny models, right? Because the big models are just the artifacts in the world. In the case of causal abstraction, it's a storm system like the weather or the human brain or an artificial neural network. You have these very complicated black box systems with all sorts of connected micro variables, but you want to sort of find faithful ways to aggregate this information into a form that a human could use to make decisions. So I guess that's sort of like the, the dream and we have to, we start with the black box. All right. So de jargoning that, we have Goal of mechanistic interpretability, or I don't know, any reasonable interpretability, is you have this weird messed up artifact of a neural network, you want to understand the neural network. The neural network is made out of maths, but it's kind of an inscrutable mass of linear algebra. We want to be able to think about what it's doing in this nice algorithmic way. We believe it often has learned reasonable algorithms. Like, I don't know, it's predicting the next token, you give it text like ice cream, and it predicts that Sunday comes next because ice cream Sunday is a common trigram. Mm -hmm. And this is implemented in the matrices in this cursed, screwed up way, but you can totally map this to a causal model like P is ice, Q is cream. If P equals ice and Q equals cream, output Sunday. And if you can find bits of the model that map onto bits in that diagram, you're like, I've just understood the model, everything is great. Yeah, and I think it gets increasingly more interesting the more that these variables represent concepts that are compositions of many of the inputs, rather than sort of things that correspond directly to the input, like this P and V1 situation, where this is just really the mediation of information. But it's very interesting if you have like a paragraph of text and you need to make multi-hop reasoning steps where you need to sort of create a Boolean proposition that's like, is this statement true or false, given a synthesis of information over text. So essentially the dream is to be able to articulate any sort of reasoning algorithm at a high level and then code that in a causal model and then look for the variables in that algorithm at a high level in the low level network. 
Gotcha. Like you could imagine something like you give the model a page from Harry Potter, and at the end you ask it, who is writing the third broomstick? And the model's capable of answering the question, it's big enough, but this is kind of a complicated task, and it's going to involve a lot of synthesis of information in the text, and like tracking different concepts, like who's on each broomstick, who are the characters, where are they, what are they doing, which pronouns refer to which characters. But like the dream would be that we could actually map this to some causal model. And are we talking about the wild dreams of interpretability, but we're currently staring at neurons? Or do you think like there's actual interpretability work that looks roughly like that? You've got a paragraph, you answer a sophisticated question about it, and you can understand how the model reasoned through the question. I don't think that work exists yet. I do feel like it is within the bounds of existing tools, though. I don't think we would need rapid methodological developments. Like, I think with the same sort of uh, mindset as like causal mediation analysis or the Rome paper or causal scrubbing or our work. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of scaling those ideas up to more interesting algorithms with like more interesting structures like loops and hierarchical variable structures or control flows. And uh, yeah. 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 All right. Do you want to get back to the title? We still haven't finished defining everything in the title. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Getting back to the title. So causal models. Also, yeah, I guess the best maybe um, completely lame in definition of causal models, there's just circles and then there's lines between circles and then there's lookup tables telling you what value a circle should be given all the circles that point to it. And that is unironically a causal model. That It's like a very generic way of talking about things. And I think pretty much anything, any computational object you want to talk about, you can talk about that way. Sorry, that's not a good layman's explanation of a causal model. A causal model is like some <laughs> algorithm. You have some variables, you step through the algorithm, it tells you what to do at each step. And you give some examples. That's a better layman's definition. But it's, I think it's useful to think of these as very disjointed mathematical objects. You know, really, in the end, all they are are just circles and lines and lookup tables. And we're just talking about, like, connecting that kind of object with another one of that kind of object. I do recognize that maybe my brain's a little different than... Uh... <laughs> I will also note, these are blatantly squares rather than circles. They become circles once you rotate them into distributed space. All the shapes matter. Shall we go back to the second half of the title? Yes, the second half of the title. All right, distributed neural representations. That's the second half of the title we're talking about now, right? What does that mean? What's a neural? What's a distributed? What's a representation? In this narrative we have going where we're trying to reverse engineer a neural network by finding a simple causal model, aligning a variable in that causal model with a cluster of neurons, if you actually are only focused on aligning a variable with a cluster of neurons, it's a very limited way of engaging with the, the question because you're assuming a privileged basis representation. So if you have a vector of like 50 neurons, you could just say, oh, I think it's going to be this clump of neurons. But you could also say, take that 50 dimensional vector and then represent it in some rotated basis. And then we want to align high level variables with the dimensions in this rotated basis. And so the reason these are sort of a distributed representation is that any dimension in this rotated basis is going to contribute to many dimensions in the unrotated basis. All right, so much jargon. Let's stop and unpack that. Also, can I just say, it is a bad sign that it's taking us this long to get through the title. <laughs> but we're doing mechanistic interpretability. One of the key things we need to do is break our model down into units of analysis that can be understood independently. Model internals are made up of tens of thousand dimensional vectors with millions to billion dimensional parameters. These are ridiculously complicated, and we need to know the right units of analysis to like reason about things independently and be like, this thing detects dogs, this thing detects the text is in French, things like that. The most convenient possible world is that individual neurons, like individual basis elements, individual floating points within the vector of the model are meaningful. Like this neuron refers to a cat, this neuron refers to a dog. You are referring to clumps of neurons, which seems a bit surprising to me. Can you say more about that? Like why would you ever want more than one neuron? 
I guess you just want to align a high level variable with whatever component happens to serve the causal role of that high level variable. It may be a single neuron, it may be a set of neurons within a larger neural representation, or in the repeated case, it might be some direction in the space, in the real valued space, or it could be some set of orthogonal directions. Gotcha. And so check, are we talking about the residual stream or the MLP layers of the transform? The residual stream. All right. So brief background on transformers for people who are not familiar. Transformers, I mean, transformers and neural networks, they have a bunch of layers. But notably, rather than the input to the next layer being the output of the previous layer, each transformer layer reads from the residual stream this like accumulated memory of the model, and its output is just added to the residual stream. And so you can think of each layer as an incremental update. Everything the model knows is stored in the residual stream. What the input is, what position you're at, whatever intermediate variables is computed, like this text is positive and fluffy. This text is advertising copy about headphones. I should be outputting a pronoun next. And also the model's best guess for the actual output. And it's kind of this compressed mess of stuff. Importantly, there isn't any particular reason for the individual like elements of this to be meaningful. Atticus calls these neurons. I prefer not to call them neurons. I reserve neurons for anything that comes after a element-wise nonlinearity, like a relu or a jelu, because in like the middle of a transformer MLP layer, you'll do something like for every individual basis element apply a jelly or a relu to it in a way which actually does create a privilege basis. Yes, absolutely. In the transformer residual stream, everything that interacts with it is purely linear. So you could just apply an arbitrary rotation to it and apply that same rotation to all of the weights that read and write from it, and the model would work exactly the same. The one exception to this is Adam, the fancier version of stochastic gradient descent used to make these models which is cursed and means actually the basis is like a tiny bit privileged, which there's a fun anthropic paper about. But let's leave that aside. Yeah, and actually the first experiment in this is going to be just on a multi-layer NLP, like a uh, multi-layer NLP, multi-layer perceptron. Wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Like your ATM machine and pin number. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know anyways, so finishing unpacking the concepts, the residual stream is just like a big vector for every token in the text given to our model. You can kind of think of this as like a big vector for every word. We don't know what a token is. And this vector is, I don't know, let's say a thousand dimensional. And the model is representing a lot of information here, which corresponds to different directions in space. Like in the classic case of word embeddings, you have king minus queen equals man minus woman as a linear representation of things, where linear representation is the jargon for there are different directions that mean things, and you can add up these directions to get whatever combination you want. Like, the male plus royalty direction gives you king, the male plus no royalty direction gives you man, etc. So by distributed here, we basically just mean we do not know which direction things go in, like we don't know what the meaningful directions are, because we don't have this super convenient thing where just like each floating point is meaningful. And part of the point of this paper is figuring out the right units of analysis by finding the meaningful directions. How's that? Exactly, yeah. Beautiful. And maybe specifically the phrase distributed representation is connected to sort of like the in the 80s when people were working on AI slash like neuroscience, Paul Smolensky kind of proposed exactly this idea of there being sort of privileged non-standard basis for interpreting uh, neural networks and that being a way to understand these polysemanticity and neurons that they're talking about. So that's a fun historical connection. Gotcha. All right. And I'm going to take this as a chance to sound on my soapbox and explain a few other points that are worth knowing. Mm -hmm. The first is just that I think a subtlety people often miss when thinking about transformers for the first time is that there's a massive difference between the vectors representing a transformer residual stream and the vectors in the middle of a transformer MLP layer immediately after the jellies. This is because you can kind of think of a transformer MLP layer 
as the bit of the model used to do computation, like thinking and processing. The gelus are used to like compute new features the model doesn't already have. Like it can go from the previous word was Eiffel, the current word is tower, to this is the Eiffel Tower using the neurons, but it can't do it in the residual stream. And because there are gelus, the basis in the MLP is like kind of privileged, and we can kind of think of the neurons as a starting point for like the right units of analysis. While in the residual stream, we basically just have nothing. So maybe your mind will change after the results we see where we're actually unable to find a basis aligned uh, representation in a pure MLP just trained on our task. And we are able to find a perfect representation of the causal variables under a rotated basis. And that's just an MLP with ReLU units. So at least in that model, it seems like they're still not getting a... Uh, the privileged basis, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So the second thing I'm going to say while I'm on my soapbox mm -hmm. is uh, this idea of superposition, which I think is interestingly different from the idea of a distributed representation. Let me just briefly pause and share my screen. So superposition, going back to the difference between MLP layers and the residual stream, we have this beautiful theoretical argument for why the residual stream of a model should not have a privileged basis, while neurons should, because models internally want to extract and represent a bunch of features of the input, and they want to be able to do this in a way that doesn't interfere with each other. Like, you want to be able to represent this word is a dog and this text is in French without interfering so that it's harder to compute about English dog text versus French dog text, etc. Because gelus or relus act on each neuron independently, it makes sense for the model to want to align each feature with a neuron. This is a beautiful theoretical argument. Sadly, it's wrong. In practice, models often have polysemantic neurons, where the neuron seems to represent a bunch of things, like it will represent dogs, but it will also represent flowers or some crap like that. This is like kind of surprising. I genuinely think there is something that needs to be explained here, because if the model just has as many features as it has neurons, it should just obviously want them to be neuron aligned. And the superposition hypothesis says that the reason things are not neuron aligned is that models want to compress in more features than they have dimensions. In order to do this, this means they need to have features that are not orthogonal to each other, i.e. can interfere with each other. If you have more features than you have neurons, you're just going to have this problem. Like, you can't have a feature per neuron. And this, like, beautiful paper, Toy Models of Superposition, that I have a different walkthrough about, trained this, like, toy model and found that this model would learn to perform superposition. If the features were sufficiently rare, it would compress them in, so you now have four in two dimensions and then five in two dimensions, and they're not orthogonal, they interfere with each other. As far as we can tell, this is a lot of what's going on in actual language models. We think that superposition is a lot of why neurons in a language model are polysemantic. The model is just computing more features than it has dimensions and somehow shoving these into the different neurons, and it's kind of wild. I recently worked on this paper led by Wes Gurney that I should have a forthcoming walkthrough about, where we actually found evidence of superposition in models. We were looking at how they detect compound words like social security, found a bunch of neurons that detect it kind of badly, like the blue bit is social security, and then this is a bunch of stuff that's not social security. Each neuron is kind of bad, but the neurons added together and now fucking fucking fabulous. This is important because it means that you can't even think about a model in terms of find the right rotation. You need to think about a model in terms of like, understand all of the compressed features with the, like more directions than you have dimensions, and understanding how to deal with this. If you only care about certain features, you can think about things like finding the right rotation, but this is ultimately going to be an approximation. And the final point before I get off my soapbox and let Atticus talk again is there's this big conceptual difference between superposition as a form of compression, like the model just has more features than it has space to store them and needs to squash them in, which is what the residual stream does. This kind of has to be happening because models have a vocabulary of like 50,000 tokens, but they have like a thousand dimensions in the residual stream. 
So obviously they are doing some compression, which we think is superposition. And then MLP layers, the jellies are actually doing computation, but they also seem to have more things they're computing than features, which is this whole other thing we're confused about. So yeah, returning to the idea of distributed representations, there's like actually two related ideas here. There's you have features that are not aligned with the standard basis, which should obviously happen for the residual stream, should not obviously happen for MLP layers. But then you also have this idea of superposition with as many more meaningful directions that there are dimensions. And this necessarily implies distributed representations, but it's also like a stronger and weirder claim that's more of a pain. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Yeah, and uh, I'm yeah, very recently excited about figuring out how this connects to superposition because exactly yes. these sort of methods, uh, I feel like this is the just the right direction to be going in. And that, I don't know, the crucial connection there also between more features than neurons, but also sparse features that like that third part is as crucial as the first two for understanding this mm. phenomenon, because, uh, you know, when they'd have non-sparse features, if they get exactly a one-to-one -one neuron feature correspondence in the toy superposition model, mm -hmm. and then it's by increasing sparsity, which then means you actually don't have to keep track of many types of comparisons between features, right? Just yeah, I feel briefly like exactly. un mm -hmm. unpacking sparsity. I try to use the word prevalence because sparsity is too many things. So uh, there's like a bunch of things you want to know about the world, especially if you're a language model. For example, mm -hmm. knowing who Atticus Geiger is is like a delightful thing that everyone wants to know, but like, uh -huh. no offense, it's not that useful. Of course. Predicting the next token like most of the time, but it will mm -hmm. occasionally matter. Like you've got a text about mechanistic interpretability, it mentions Atticus Geiger, and you know it's now going to use the wrong jargon for everything rather than the right jargon. <laughs> um, but it doesn't come up very often. And it'd be kind of dumb to dedicate an entire neuron to it. Because like, I don't know, GPT-3 has like a few million neurons, but it knows a lot more than a few million facts, probably. Mm -hmm. And because this is like kind of rare, and the rarer two things are, the easier it is to represent them in superposition because... Yep. If you just have to tell which one is there when the other one isn't there, this is kind of cheap. While if the two things mm -hmm. occur at the same time, or just occur a bunch, it's just like way harder and high effort. And this is also is one of the only reasons superposition might be remotely solvable, because when you have more directions and you have dimensions, you're just kind of fucked when mm -hmm. it comes to recovering this, because, I don't know, math's theorem there are just infinitely many <laughs> ways to represent a given vector as a linear combination of a set of directions mm. which are more than the number of dimensions. But if you say it has to be a sparse combination, where here sparsity is because any given input only has so many features. Yeah. Kind yeah, of the exactly. inverse notion, 20 feature only occurs in many input, in like a handful of inputs. Because like, I don't know, text about Neil Nanda, you're not going to be needing to use all your knowledge about Python code, say. This is now a constraint, and this can let you figure out how some vector is represented in terms of these combinations. One big problem is learning how to take a model and its activations and recover this meaningful set of directions. But that is so not in scope for this video. All right, we figured out the title. What next? Do you want Here... to stop sharing your screen again? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of um, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, let's Here we let me are. just try to summarize what the title means to fully round off this glorious hour of exposition. We have interpretable causal variables and diagrams. This is like some algorithm where we have meaningful inputs and we use these inputs to compute a bunch of intermediate variables that we know what they mean and we compute some output. We want to find an alignment between this and a network by mapping activations in the network to bits in our diagram. And like, we have a bunch of theory we haven't gone into about how you do this in like a real rigorous way where you're not just bullshitting yourself. Uh-huh, exactly. And in order to know what the right chunks of the model are to map to this diagram, you need to know the right units of analysis. But if you want to take, say, a model's residual stream, it's like shared memory that accumulates everything, there's not a meaningful basis where you can just be like, this axis, this axis, and this axis are the right units. Each means its own thing. 
you need to find meaningful directions. It's even more cursed because there's actually superposition going on, where there's more features than there are dimensions, but you're not even going to get into that in this paper. Not even. You're just trying to answer the question of how do you find the right direction such that it is a node in your diagram? Yep, right on. Then how do you do all of the like causal understanding of what's actually going on? Wow. You know, if that's your summary of the title, I mean, why even read the paper in my opinion? That was a great, that was a great summary of the title. Uh, I mean, I feel like that really just, yeah, that's exactly what this paper is about. All right. Maybe let's end part one here. People understand the title. This is all they uh -huh. really need. Life is great. Uh -huh. Thanks all for joining me. Mm -hmm. We're going to transition <laughs> to part two. Actually understanding anything about this paper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>